Hi, I'm Sal Mercagliano, Associate Professor of History at Campbell University, a former merchant mariner and an instructor in maritime industry policy at the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. And welcome to this, the Groundhog Edition of What's Going on the Suez, April 25th, 2021. Groundhog Edition because there's not a lot going on here and it's getting to be a little bit repetitive for what we see happening. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of news going on in the Suez. We're going to go ahead and give you the latest update. Uh, vessel still anchored in the Great Bitter Lake. Uh, some stories have come out recently. I'm going to recap them real quick. Talk a little bit about what we can expect to see happening. Obviously, the biggest thing was the effort by the insurance company, the UK P&I, to appeal the detention within an Egyptian court. They're filing against the $916 million injunction for the arrest of motor vessel ever given by the Egyptians. And again, this massive cost is, is broken up into three large parts here. Uh, $300 million is because of a salvage bonus. $316 million is to recoup costs directly lost during the salvage and, and, and recovery of the vessel. And then the other $300 million is for loss of reputation for the canal. I have lost elements of my reputation over the life, never worth $300 million. Uh, this is all going to be adjudicated on May 4th in an Egyptian court. Not exactly clear how this Egyptian court would overrule the Egyptian government and the Suez Canal Authority. The envisionment here is that this would remain and then the next step would have to be undertaken. What that next step is, we're not sure. We know that Ever Given, ukp and I, and all the other players are deeply involved in negotiations with the Suez Canal Authority and the Egyptian government. At the same time, ships are continually traveling through the canal using it, including evergreen ships. Uh, the nine large shipping companies are going to have a real big problem with one of their vessels being held basically hostage and for ransom by the Egyptians. Uh, again, accident occurred. We're not exactly sure what caused the accident, but you don't usually typically hold the vessel until a determination is made. Sometimes these investigations can go on for a year. In the meantime, there's cargo on the vessel. There's 23 of the 25 remaining crew members on the vessel. And there's also the fear that the Egyptians may do this for other vessels going through the canal. I got to imagine if you're the major shipping lines, you're going to be worried about your vessel going through the canal and this potentially happening with you. Again, insurance rates will start to increase because of the higher risk associated with the ships going through. We saw something very similar in the early 2000s with Somali pirates. When the Somali, I'm not calling the Egyptians pirates here, but the Somali pirates would seize a ship, go to a shipping company, demand million, several million dollars worth of, of, of ransom. Uh, the company would debate whether or not to pay or not. And usually they'd wind up paying. This was cheaper to pay it than for the vessel to be held for a long period of time. The only time you hear about the rescue of, of, of people from Somali hostages, if it's Tom Hanks or more importantly, an American, and then the American Navy responds, or if it's a French vessel, the French Navy responds. That's really the only time we ever saw that. When you're dealing with ships, and in this case, the Egyptians keep labeling this ship a Panamanian ship. They, they're really hard against the Panamanians because, too, the Panamanian registry is the, one of the largest registries out there. So the, if the Egyptians target the Panamanian registry, that's a problem. That can in, impact not just evergreen vessels, but a slew of vessels that fly the, the Panamanian flag. It could also mean that if, ever, that if the Egyptians are focusing on the Panamanian flag, that could cause the Panamanians to lose registry vessels. They could flip over to Liberia, Marshall Islands, Cyprus, Isle of Man, all these other open registries. And then the Panamanians may want to kick in some money. So the Egyptians are playing a pretty interesting game right now. The question is, how long will the Egyptians hold this vessel? We just saw the chief mate on the Syrian vessel, that, thanks to the ITF, the International Transportation Federation, were able to get on board, get him released. That was four years he'd been on that vessel. So not exactly sure what's going to happen here. At the same time, this story in GCAP right here, container lines firmly in control as market stays red hot. Man, chartering of container ships right now is through the roof. We're seeing record uh, uh, charter rates. We're seeing uh, freight rates through the route right now. Containers, charters are, are just, you know, spot charters on ships are going like that. Uh, the rates are through the roof. Again, this is, this is demonstrating how hot everything is to get moved right now. Uh, we're seeing that because of large demand in countries and exports. Sorry, dog squeaking her ball. Uh, large demand being 
demanded by people. And again, we're still catching up from COVID. And now this element here, which shutting down the Suez for six days has caused shipyard, excuse me, uh, uh, terminals in Europe and Asia to get a little bit backed up. Same time, we're seeing jockeying for positions here by the major carriers. Mediterranean Shipping Company is poised to overtake Maersk as the world's largest container liner. But both those companies, MSC and Maersk, are in an alliance together, the 2M alliance. So it doesn't really matter. Plus, Maersk is hedging its bet right now. They are not, they have no contracts out for new builds right now. Maersk is the one who kicked off this big, huge, ultra large container ship race. They are holding back for a very good reason because they're waiting for engine designs and engine propulsions to get stabilized before they really spend some money right now in investing in a new ship that could be around for 20 or 30 years, right when IMO 2050 kicks in. So they're kind of hedging their bet right now. A fairly smart move by uh, Maersk right now to do that. Plus, if you hold construction of vessels, freight rates stay abnormally high. And if you're a ship owner, that's what you want. You want freight rates to be high. You want to be able to charge five, ten, thirteen thousand $13,000 for a box to move because that just increases your profit profitability. And understand in shipping, profitability happens during these peaks. During normal course of operations, your, your margins are really slow, really very small, excuse me. But during this period of time, when, when rates spike, that's when you start making your money like crazy. And that's what we're seeing happening here. Uh, this great story out by Splash, this is from a few uh, a week or two ago, but it's still a good one. Talks about what the Ever Given can tell us about the mental health at sea. Again, I keep coming back to those crew members. They've been on board Ever Given, stuck in the lake now for a month. And, and that's a lot of time. And you got to start worrying about the health and well-being of the crews on board the vessel. And it's been an issue throughout this COVID pandemic, I have to tell you. It's a, it's, a, it's a big, huge issue that I talk about all the time, and it needs to be talked about much more. Uh, being locked up on a ship, not being able to get off. And understand, even on routine voyages of vessels, crews don't get off the ships too more. It's not like it used to be. I mean, every, people have this image that you pull in a port and you go exploring and you have a great day. That's not what happens. Pull into a container terminal, you're there for less than a day. You typically can't get off the terminal because of security. So maybe if you're lucky, you get off the vessel for a little bit of time, go to a, a bar or restaurant that's on the terminal that you can go and relax and get something to eat, get beer, see people who you don't see every day. That's the worst part is you're with the same people every day. You're just always the same. You run out of stories after a while that tell each other. And so you're, you're basically trying to break up the monotony. And the problem is that's can go on for months at a time. And now with COVID, you go on for half a year for even longer at a time. So there's always this issue going on here about the, the well-being of the crew. Uh, talked about the freight, freight rates here, container rates a minute ago. Man, this is this is the story right here. You want to read this story? This is a great one. Starts talking about the freight rates right here, talking about how much it costs. Uh, talking about here that Matson, which is an American container line, uh, they operate within the closed trade, what's called the Jones Act trade, which is, means you can only be American owned, American built. Poorly charted a 4,000 uh, TU ship, 41,000 per day for service between the China and US trade so that they can feed into their vessels. Uh, we're seeing the same thing. A lot of these companies are chartering vessels. They, uh, one of the big firms has chartered vessels that are in the China trade, the internal China trade to do it. CMA uh, did that to get some vessels out of the internal China trade to do it. And you're just seeing these escalating charter rates right here, man, just through the roof. It's, it's crazy how high it's getting. And this is great for the container carriers in a strange way, ever given getting grounded in the Suez is a boon for char for container companies because now the, the freight rates just go through the roof. And, and that's been happening ever since then. We see that happening. So again, understanding this is, is a really complex issue. And one of the things I try to do is make it available to the normal everyday person to understand why all of a sudden goods are costing more, why the shelves in Home Depot and, and Lowe's not have as much goods on it as they did before, or why is building material through the roof right now, or things that we took for common and everything. I want to build a fence in my backyard, but man, fencing material is just through the roof right now. I may have to hold off on that because I, I don't want to pay two to three times normal what the fencing costs. And so a lot of people, this could impact the building industry in the United States, home, home building, all that kind of stuff has these ramifications because of the international trade market. This story right here, viewpoint settling for general average. We talked about general average regarding uh, ever given. The fact that they declared general average means that the costs 
that are going to be incurred on the vessel on Ever Given is going to be shared not just among Ever Given, uh, excuse me, Evergreen, the company, not just through the owners, not just through the operators, but through those who put cargo on board. That's that fine print that no one ever reads in their iTunes agreement. Now all of a sudden, you know, you shipped a couple of boxes loaded with whatever you want from China to Europe, and now all of a sudden it's going to cost you more than the cargo was worth, maybe to get it off because you're involved in general average. And this is a great little description of what general average is, provides that background. So really strongly recommend this article. And then finally, a story I mentioned before, which had a, unfortunately, a, again, a, another tragic end, ending here. We've been talking about this. There's actually another story I'm gonna pull up here in a minute. I wanna show you all, but two stories of, of loss of life recently that we've seen. Again, Ever Given was, was I think one of the reasons it became very popular was no one got hurt, no one died. And, and so it's a, a marine tragedy without a lot of tragedy. I mean, you didn't even kill pelicans or ducks with an oil spill. But here down in the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico, one of these uh, uh, work boats, uh, what they call a lift boat, uh, capsized in a storm. Just absolutely tragic story. The boat should not have been out there, shouldn't have been in 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 this type of, of seas and storm. More importantly, there wasn't a crew boat following it so that, so that the crew on the work boat can get off. Very unique type vessels. They're designed to put their jacks down and lift up and do work, work on these platforms. Sorry, dog barking. But these platforms are designed to be lifting up and be able to work. The problem is this vessel got caught in the storm, flipped over and sank, and now there's a uh, lawsuit against them. Sorry, dog just wants to bark. Last story here, also from G Captain, another tragic story. The submarine, the Indonesian submarine that was presumed missing has now been found uh, uh, well below its crush depth. Uh, the hull has been compromised and the 53 crew members on board have died. So a tragic loss to that or a tragic end to that story, unfortunately. And again, shows how dangerous the sea can be. And sometimes we take for granted, even though these are Navy sailors with the Indonesian Navy, the Sea Corps vessel was a commercial vessel, civilian mariners. Uh, the sea doesn't care. It doesn't care if you work for the military. It doesn't care if you work for civilian. It doesn't care what government you work for. Uh, when it decides it's had enough, it's had enough. And it's really difficult to overcome a uh, very small margin of error in the seafaring industry. And we saw that would ever given it only took a little bit for that vessel to get off kilter. And then boom, you have a, an incident that gets worldwide attention. Well, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you like, please subscribe, hit the bell. So you'll be alerted for new videos as they come out and stay tuned for new videos as I post them. So thanks for joining us. See you in the next episode.